Welcome to Courtside Moms. I'm your host, Wendy Sparks. Today, we are continuing Magic Mom Month, where my guest is Mandy Carter Zigorowski, the mother of Michael Carter Williams. Let's get right to it and bring Mandy on the show. Welcome, Mandy, to the show. I feel so blessed that you are here spending some time with me so we can talk about your baby. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited and appreciate it. Well, we've been doing, uh, well, we're in the process of doing a Magic Mom Month. So this is fantastic that we have yet another Magic Mom joining us today. Yes. So I like to break things down when speaking um, to moms about their kids' paths, as uh, there are many parents out there who are unaware of where to go and what to do. So your perspective, I'm sure, will be totally different as some of the moms that I've pre- previously spoken to, because you have basketball in your life, you have a basketball background, so you understand you know what I mean? Like what to know right. and where to go and what to do. So I'm really excited to um, to learn how you see basketball through your eyes. So let's talk about Michael. So how did the world of basketball begin for him? I would say um, both my husband and I were coaching high school basketball when Michael, I think we started when Michael was probably around um, five years old. Um, my husband actually played, he played in college and I had Michael young, so we would bring him to the games and he would watch the games and run up and down. And, you know, was always a very energetic kid. But when we both started coaching high school basketball, Michael would come with us to our practices, you know, at, at a really young age. And we weren't thinking, you know, anything professional at that point, you know, we were just, um, happy to have him come to the practices and get some energy out, especially in the winter up here in Massachusetts, because he wasn't getting outside very much. So it was nice to have him just running around, but he was, um, he was a little athlete from the beginning, kind of an all around athlete. How old was he when he took an interest in, uh, playing basketball? Oh, he loved it, you know, from day one, like he had a ball in his hand. I think his first word was ball in his baby book. And he, um, he had a ball in his hand at our practices. And then in kindergarten, when they, you know, you could start playing in town and stuff, he started playing and he was one of the few kids in kindergarten that actually like really knew the game because he had been following us around with our high school teams. Um, but you know, at the time he played football and he played baseball too. So we weren't sure. And, you know, he loved them all and was, was pretty good at, you know, at all of them, all the way up to um, eighth grade, he played Mm -hmm. three sports. So he was pretty well rounded. And then, I mean, we always knew that he was really, you know, pretty good at basketball, he would, you know, play a grade above, which was nice that he could, you know, get another level of competition and stuff. And he definitely stood out, but he was pretty small, and he was really thin. So, you know, we weren't thinking anything again, like anything too great about him at that time when he was, when he was younger, we just thought, okay, you know, hopefully he'll stick with it and he'll get a scholarship in one of the sports that he enjoys doing. And it'll probably be basketball because football made me nervous. It was so physical and, you know, he was, he was on the smaller side. Yeah. Yeah. My son played football too, actually. Um, and I used to get so nervous too. I didn't like it. I mean, he would get tackled and I'm that mom that would run on the field. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which made no sense. I'm like, get off my baby. <laughs> made no sense because they're supposed to tackle him. And I used to get like blue mad, but. Oh, anyhow. gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I got over it and I was like, okay, this is what it's supposed to be. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when did he start playing organized basketball? Like how old was his, how old was he when he was like, you know what? I want to play on a team now. Oh, pretty young. Um, I, I think in this town it was fifth grade when they started playing travel basketball. So, you know, you made the travel team and you got to travel around to different local towns and play against each other. So he started in fifth grade um, and they had a, they had a really good team. Actually, he was fortunate. Sometimes, you know, you get grades that have some athletic kids in the grade that love playing sports. And he definitely had that group of kids that were really good. So he, he started pretty early on. Was that like AAU? Like did they travel? No, it wasn't AAU. It was just okay. um, town travel. And then right. I think it was eighth grade that my husband, um, I'm trying to think, maybe seventh or eighth grade that my husband put together um, an AAU team that nice. he was coaching at Charlestown High School. And yeah, so I think 
it was eighth grade. Um, he had some of his Charlestown kids that wanted to play AAU. And then there were some kids out here in Hamilton that wanted to play. So we formed a team and we just kind of put our own name to it called Mass Hoop Elite. And um, Zach coached it. And at that point, I think that's when things started to get pretty serious. He had played JV basketball in eighth grade because um, at the Catholic school that he went to at St. Mary's, he was allowed to do that. And then yeah. he did this AAU team with Zach and we happened to go to a tournament an AAU tournament in Foxborough. Um, and we got matched up against BABC, which is a very well-known team that we didn't really know that much about. My husband knew of it um, just because he, you know, grew up playing basketball and was around kids that played on BABC, but I didn't really know anything about it. And we were playing against them. And I remember the coach saying, I had overheard him saying he was playing a bunch of scrubs from Hamilton <laughs> and that it was going to be a, you know, a blowout game. And it, it turned out to go to double overtime. And I think Michael had like 37 points. And it was one of those games where everybody just came over to watch because everybody on the BABC team was already, you know, had D1 offers and they were this, you know, elite national Nike team that Michael went up against and um, had this one great game. And, and very honestly, we went from kind of small town Hamilton basketball to all of a sudden we had um, Mikey, that team calling us for him to play. The Adidas team called us to play. Michael, we heard from St. Andrew's school in Rhode Island for Michael to come there and, and get an education, which he ended up doing and playing basketball for them. So I would say at that point, his life completely changed. And I mean, maybe he would have headed in that direction anyway, but it was, you know, kind of crazy that it was just one game and, and all of a sudden, you know, yeah. our, our lives were going in a total different direction. Was he already now in high school at Hamilton when in regional at that point? Um, where was he? Yes. So he was, we had reclassified him. So he had gone to St. Mary's for a year because again, he was, um, yeah. just hadn't grown at all. He was really, he was probably like five, eight, 130 pounds. Um, so we had reclassed him. So he came back to Hamilton as a, um, as a freshman, I'm trying to think back now, as a freshman, and then he ended up, um, and that's when he left right. after that year and went to St. Andrews. Right. Okay. So that's in Rhode Island, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, so we played his freshman year in Hamilton and had a great year, and then he went off to St. Andrews. So why the transfer? Like, what was it about uh, St. Andrews that you felt would be a good fit for him? Well, the basketball was at a much higher level. Hamilton mm -hmm. is a pretty small town. It was, you know, good for Michael at the size he was at at that point, I think, you know, physically, he was still getting challenged somewhat, but we had done our research and learned a lot about um, coach Mike Hart, you know, over at St. Andrews and him working with the players. And I also thought it would be a good opportunity for a little bit of diversity and change. Mm -hmm. And academically, there's the classrooms were super small. You know, he went from 24 kids in a classroom to, you know, some of his classes only had six or seven kids in yeah. them. So uh, the learning opportunity for him that did better with a lot of hands-on work was, was much better as well. But, you know, mostly I would say the opportunity for him to really develop every day in practice and just getting pushed by other athletes who had this, you know, similar goals was, was really the opportunity. Yeah. My son, he went to uh Winchenden uh, yes. prep school actually. Yeah. So he went from public school, like you're saying from 24 kids. And then when you went to Winchenden, I think it was like six kids. So, right. you know what I mean? You had the, the athletic, the athleticism was totally different, but the education was, was completely different too. So I thought it was just a better learning opportunity for him because it was really new for him. I mean, he, he came from Canada, you know, going to the U S and the education system is so different. The courses are so different. So for me right. as a mom, I appreciated the smaller, smaller classes. I just thought it was a better fit for him. Yeah, I did. I definitely did too. The whole yeah. all around opportunity that you get there, there's just, you know, more enrichment and more opportunity and kids aren't kind of slotted into either you're an athlete or you're a theater. Right. You can kind of like do a little bit of everything at a lot of those boarding schools. So it is great opportunity. So what were those games like at St. Andrews? Did you notice like scouts watching him? And if you did, did you speak to the scouts? No. Well, I don't. His first year there. I remember um, Coach Hart telling us his first year there that Syracuse was interested mm -hmm. and I didn't really believe him. They had gone to the Syracuse camp and I remember being like, really? Like we would have been like really happy with Merrimack or Lowell or, you know, stuff like that. I was like, how could they be interested already? Again, he was, now he's grown and he's probably like six feet, six one and still like super skinny. So I was just a little bit nervous. And I remember um, when he went to the 
the whole team went to a camp and coach Beheim talked to us after. And I remember, and he always reminds me of this, how I, I said, um, you know, we don't, he's not the type of kid that's going to do well if he's in that group of kids that you have that are just there as practice players. Like we don't want him to be just a practice player. We really right. want him to go to a school where he'll have an opportunity to play, even yep. if it's at a lower level. Yeah. And he said, you know, no, we really like him. I think you're going to be you know, surprised where you see him, you know, go with this whole basketball journey. So they were like on him pretty early. Um, but it took a while that they were one school that was on him early. And then over time, it got, you know, really, really busy. And Coach Hart would often call me and say, hey, you know, Notre Dame head coach is coming in. Can you get here after work and, and meet him, you know, briefly and Miami's coming. And so it's funny when it's your first time around, because, you know, Michael has got some younger brothers and we went, yeah through something, you know, different, but similar with them. But it's the uh, first time around, you're like, okay, sure. Yeah, I'll go. I'll meet him there. Like you kind of don't yeah. even realize how truly special and, you know, it, it is while it's yeah. all happening. Um, yep. You're excited, but, you know, nervous at the same time. And, you know, yes. you, as you know, you get a lot of um, people in your ear telling yep. you different things. Yep. Overwhelming, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, as a basketball player yourself, you have you have an advantage as you know what to look for in basketball programs. So when Michael was offered scholarships from just name a few schools, Florida State, um, Virginia, Notre Dame, Syracuse and Clemson, how did you eliminate schools before choosing the right one? Yeah, that was, um, you know, it was definitely a, a lot of. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, of just of prayer and, you know, guide me in the right to guide us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, Michael didn't like love getting a ton of phone calls. He had a hard time with, he doesn't like building relationships and then having to say no to someone. Yeah. So we did end up deciding pretty early on, but I remember we did our research in terms of, you know, who do they have coming in at what position? Who's ahead of him? You know, is he going to go, you know, is there a sophomore there in his position who's already, you know, as an All-American, so he's going to kind of sit for the next three years behind him. And um, we looked for culture, you know, really a, a lot. Like who is um, sort of getting a feel when you visit? What's the culture like there? What are the other, what are his teammates like? What are the coaches like? Did I feel like I was being told the truth? Um, right. You know, just a, a lot of that. And, and Coach Hopkins for Syracuse was involved early on and just kept in touch with us daily. And I kind of saw him as a person, not just a, a basketball coach, right? which I, I feel like helped us with, with making that decision. Well, it's good that you knew what to ask because, you know, I mean, a lot of parents don't, right? You have that right. coach or the staff or somebody from the school that comes and sits in your living room and they're talking about all the wonderful things in your program and they promise you your kid's going to play and you're like, right. okay, great. And you're so happy and I'm like, okay, you know, take your little, your little letter and this is your scholarship and go. And then right. you kid's sitting on the bench, you know what I mean? So that there's nothing worse than that, you know what I mean? So I, and, and yeah. I too, you know what I mean? I didn't know for me. A lot of the universities I never even heard of, first of all. So that I didn't even. Hard. Oh my God, yeah. I didn't know one from the other. So it was like, well, how do I search? Who do I ask? So right. it was, it was, you know what I mean? And, and the internet was, well, for me, it wasn't as popular as now. It wasn't at my fingertips, you know what I mean? Or I oh, didn't no, really know how yeah. to use it, right? I was like, oh, right. no, just let me just ask around. But there's only, I was only, I was limited at who I could ask. You only know yeah. who to ask who was in front of you and then they would find out the information. But now I look back at it, I'm like, where did they get their information from? Like I could have gone to find it, you know what I mean? And right. put my son in that in that a better position. But you never know until you try it. But anyway. It no, is what you it don't. Is. And even then you <laughs> sometimes you just don't get it right. I mean, Syracuse had told yeah. us that um two of the players, I remember where he said, because they had a lot of guards and everyone's like, yeah. Why are you going there? They have so many cards. And I said, Oh no, you know, this person's gonna be a one and done and, and this guy's a fifth year senior and he's going to be gone. So, and not that, you know, Michael had to play right away, but you want him to have a shot at, you know, fighting his way in for that, that time, you know, and um, when he got there, that didn't happen. So they were, they were guard heavy. They had four really good guards there. And, you know, Michael didn't play. He was a McDonald's all American and he sat on the bench all through the big East um, play and he wanted to transfer. So that was a really, you know, hard time. He would call us and say, you know, I'm not playing at all. I'm not going to get in all year. And, you know, this isn't what we were told. And, you know, we just kind of said, look at, you know, your team is really, really good. You know, at the time they were 18 and 0, they were number one in the country for a lot of the season and top 10 for most of the season. And I said, you guys are winning. So you can't, 
we can't say anything. And, and this is, you know, God has a plan and there's a reason why this is happening and just be ready. And the next year they weren't supposed to be as good. And they ended up going to the final four and, you know, he started and played most of the game, every game is sophomore year. So, but that, that first year was, was tough. Cause we thought we did our homework, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you had to, and it's funny because you're, you're at the coach's mercy. Yes. Maybe there's, there's nothing you can do. It's just come and sit and don't worry. He'll, you'll have that opportunity and it doesn't come fast enough. You know what I mean? Right. Michael was playing in, you know, St. Andrews and he was fantastic. And you know what I mean? He was doing everything. He was a starter. And then he goes and he, and he goes from that to sitting. And I don't think people understand what that, you know what I mean? The psyche for a young teenage boy. You oh, know yeah, it's really to, hard. You're high and then you're low. So how is it like for you to keep it motivated to still believe in Syracuse and just stick with the program and just say, listen, it, it's, it's going to come. You're going to have to be patient, which we know teenage boys are not. No, they're not. They're not. And, you know, I, I think with the staff there, I remember I did have a few conversations. I just said, listen, it's fine. He's not playing and, and we're on, you know, I want to be on the same side as you. Cause I think it's really tough for, for kids if the parents are telling them something different than the coaches are saying, yes. you know, I think it's hard that it gets very confusing. You know, you don't want to bash the program or bash the coach because at the end of the day, that's where your son's going every day to practice and, and, and play under, you know, it's like going to work every day with a boss you don't like. It's not, yeah. it's not fun. So you want to figure out a way to try to make it so, you know, he can gain something from it and, and still enjoy his time there. So we just really focused on, why don't you work hard? You've got really good players in front of you. Like go hard at them at practice every day and get better. Like just, just work on yeah. your game every single day and your contributions are helping them win because they're going up against you, you know, and there was another guard there too. That was, um, so, you know, they would just all the two of them go against each other every single day and, and worked hard and it was tough, but I was, you know, I'm almost most proud of Michael for getting, through that. Cause I did say to him, if you want to leave, Michael, you can leave, you can transfer. It happens all the time. You know, over yeah. 50% of the kids that are on scholarship <laughs> right now in division one are transferring. So if you want yeah. to, we will, we will support it. But I also feel like you can fight through this and, and he chose to stay and it was, you know, just an awesome, awesome experience for him. Yeah. See my son, he went to Pitt, and for him, it wasn't a happy situation at all. It was pretty much the same thing. You know what I mean? He's you're, you're in your, your element Right. And then you and then you go and you sit. And for him, he just couldn't understand that. And I and I understood what he was saying. You know what I mean? People were like, "Well, you know what? You you have to wait your turn." And but for him, there was just so much more with that. And for me, I found that he was as a person just becoming unhappy. So at that point, I'm like, "Well, hold on a second. You know what I mean? There's now 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 you're messing with with the child's psyche. You know what I mean? So right. I was like, "No, it's it's time to go." So he transferred. Oh, he, he did. I was decision. wondering. I, I couldn't yes. remember if he did or yeah. not. Okay. Yeah, he was at Pitt, and then he had to redshirt, and then he, um, and then he went to UNLV, and totally different, totally different animal. He was so happy, always smiling. He just couldn't wait to get on the court. You know what I mean? So where before yeah. he was always in his room, he was quiet. He didn't mix with the team a lot. So for me, I look back at it, and I'm not unhappy at the decision that he made because it yeah. just made him happy as a person. At the end of the day, basketball second, right? You just have to become your own person first. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and those are the questions that you ask, right? Are okay. you happy if when you're not on the court, do you, are you happy with your teammates? Are you happy with your friend? Do you like the yeah. school? And Michael absolutely loved Syracuse. He loved everything else about it besides the fact that he wasn't playing. And I think that's right. what also motivated us to say, well, you know, you're, you're happy there. And right now his, he still is in weddings of his teammates, you know, they're, they're still yeah. in touch and they're still super close. He's still close with the university and working with them on, on different ventures and stuff. So I, I think we knew all around that he was happy, but that's a huge thing that I think a lot of, you know, parents and our, I think everybody in society is struggling with because they think these athletes are just, they don't have feelings and they're fine and they'll get through it. And they're, you know, they, you know, they're upset because they're not playing, but there's so much more to it and that their mental health is, is a huge absolutely. piece. Yeah, absolutely. Well, his patience paid off as the following season, he started every game. And he went from sitting on the bench to becoming a top point guard. So fill us in on that conversation that you and Michael had and whoever else that was involved in the decision for him to declare for the NBA. Yeah, that was a hard one because we're all, our family are huge. We're huge college basketball fans. Like we love college basketball. Yeah. So selfishly, 
I um I kind of wasn't ready because I was like, I'm having a blast at these games. They're <laughs> so fun, you know, a packed house and we're all wearing orange and stuff. But um, we knew early on the NBA scouts were coming to the practices because one of the assistants had said to us, um, you might want to try to jump in front of it because the NBA scouts are really high on Michael. And, you know, it's it's better for Michael if he doesn't get put in the middle of it during the season because, yeah. you know, you want him to enjoy the season and just be in the day and, and yeah. not have to deal with all of that. And I was like, what are you talking about? He didn't even play last year. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> now we're talking about scouts and he's, this is, it was at the very, very beginning of the year. I was, I was, we were again, um, surprised about it because I didn't think he would get that type of attention since he hadn't played yet. So this was in the non-conference game before the conference play even started. So we did. We ended up, um, you know, if somebody found Michael's phone number, he would just give them, you know, an, an agent my number. And we kept him out of it and allowed for him to just play and not worry about all the other stuff. And then um, someone, you know, one of the assistants said, I said, well, what do we do in, in making a decision? How do you decide? And he said, well, I think if he's a lottery pick or a top 20 pick, you kind of have to go with it. You know, yeah. a lot of the times that that's it's a tough decision, but it's hard to pass on that because then you just don't know what's going to happen the next year. Right. You know, Absolutely. and they, when they ended up making it to the final four, it was kind of like you just sort of rode with that. You know, there was a lot of attention around the team. There was a lot of attention around him and his stock, you know, with different draft boards or thing. you know, all the information that people tell you to look at and the agents that we were interviewing and stuff. It just sounded like this is the right time for him to go. Yeah. So. Well, I usually ask um, about our kids and how they prepare for draft night. But let's talk about you, mom, and how you prepared mentally and emotionally for a night that could potentially change the rest of your life. Yeah, again, pretty surreal, right? Yeah. It's like uh, you don't really totally, I, I think, know what to expect with it. But we had invited um, a lot of our friends and family to New York to go to the draft, which was great that they all got to be there. And then we had planned kind of, you know, regardless what had happened, that we were all going to get together afterwards and and go out and celebrate. So, you know, of course you don't know what number they're going to go and what's going to happen. And we had been told by his agent that he was going to be, you know, he was, you don't know definitely, but you know, he said um, he's probably going to be a lottery pick. So you can sit in the green room, which was, you know, then you got to figure out, okay, who's going to sit because he's got a bunch of siblings and, you know, his dad and his stepmother and myself and, and Zach, his stepfather and, um, you know, his grandparents he was close with. So we we're trying to, you know, figure out all of that. Yeah. And then I'd say his agency Excel did a really good job. They kind of got us settled in the hotel and they had it um, like a, they made appointments for myself and a few of my friends to go and get our hair and our nails done. And my friends had helped me go to the mall and pick out a dress to get ready and stuff. So I was super excited about it. You know, I, I, I did say to his agent, you know, please tell us if we're going to sit in the green room that he's going to be one of the lottery picks. I just didn't want a, something that was so positive, no matter what number that he was right. picked at to be something like, why are we still sitting here? And, you know, I know it happens every year, but I just was like, I was so intent on, on no matter what happened, trying to make it a positive, you know, a, a positive fun night. Um, and it was just, it was really amazing. It's one of those things that it's hard to describe your emotions because you kind of like, just can't believe it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it is a big night for most, right? So yes. draft night just isn't a possibility for many, many players. When you look back at that night and remember its outcome, which was your son going 11th overall to the Philadelphia 76ers, Do you ever rewind back to the beginning and think about how it all came about? Yes, actually, you know, we do a lot because, you know, for us, you know, when you coach high school basketball, you're doing it because, you know, you love the game and you love working with kids, right? It's not really a business. It's not about money. It's it's really, you're doing it because you love the game. And for us, it was always, um, it was our family time together. Like in the summertime, Mm -hmm. um, my husband, coach, you know, local teams. And, and so did I actually from the girls side and my daughter played for me and we did workouts in our backyard and uh, we'd go down the park and we would play. And, you know, when one of our kids was playing, we all went to the game and, and we watched and it, we'd bring a picnic. It just, my husband played in summer leagues and we would go watch him. So for us, basketball was always, um, was family time. And it was something that we just like really enjoyed doing together. We loved watching it on TV together. So to have that, you know, that be our, our foundation, 
um, was sort of not necessarily, that wasn't, you know, I think it was always in, maybe in the back of Michael's head, every, you know, kid that loves basketball dreams, I'm going to be in the NBA one day, but it wasn't something that we were kind of like growing, you know, we didn't like raise him to go to the NBA. So right. I think, you know, we reflect a lot back on, and still today, because it's so hard in the NBA. Um, and it is different, you know, it's, it's very different from the basketball that Michael grew up with. So it, that, that was a bit of an adjustment for us. I love the fact that um, basketball plays such a big role in your family's lives. You know what I mean? Because you said like everybody in your family pretty much plays basketball or has something to do with basketball. I mean, there's just something about that family where everyone has that one thing in common that, um, or something relatable that each member can truly pick anyone to speak about. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. you know what I mean? Everybody in your house knows basketball. So pretty much say Michael can go to anybody. He can ask his sister, he can ask his brother, he can ask his, his stepdad, he can ask you. And, and, that's, and yeah. that's rare. So do you guys get into like basketball debates and stuff? We do. Yeah, we do definitely. When, you know, rather we're watching just a, a random team or whatever, we might go back and forth, you know, what team's better, you know, what team, you know, and there was some one-on-one -on -one growing up too. The kids played one-on-one -on -one and Zach, you know, used to play Michael a lot one-on-one -on -one cause he was, you know, younger and, and stuff. So there was, there's definitely been some, some back and forth. There's been some, you know, I, I think it's good. Like you said that we're all, we all kind of like it because, you know, if one of us is coming down hard on, you know, say if I'm coming down hard on Michael, Michael might call his sister Macy or he might call Max <laughs> or something and, and get some positive feedback. So yeah. it's not all, you know, it's not all just one person coming at you at once. You get a, You get to be a little bit more well-rounded with the feedback that you're getting and stuff. And we weren't sure that all of the kids were going to love basketball, but it kind of just turned out that way that they all did end up wanting to play. Do you find uh, when you guys watch basketball together, you're all uh, coaching from the couch? I do it. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is a lot of that. And there's many times where I'm like, I'm going upstairs because yeah. I don't want to hear you anymore. And yeah. <laughs> sometimes we have to break up and like, thank God there's a few TVs here because yeah. sometimes I'm like, I can't watch this with you. It's not fun. I'm always yeah. Like, yeah. I always sit down and say, I'm not going to be tense. I'm just going to enjoy it. Right. And then it's sure that's enough. Funny. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, that's, that's me. That's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's, so I watch our boys play with my parents. My parents are 80 and 84. Hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Hilarious. Yeah, they're so into it. At the beginning, they had no clue what was going on. Now, right. they're so versed in basketball. Like, my mom, you know great. what I mean? She gets out the chips and her little beer, and she <laughs> she's sitting there watching her yes. gym, and she talks about all the players. You know, <laughs> oh, I like the little one. The little right. one's cute. And, yeah, <laughs> they get into <laughs> debates. Yeah, my parents are hilarious. So I love, love, love watching it with them. I never thought that I'd be watching basketball with my parents. And sometimes they'll bring family members over, you know what I mean? And they're all their age. So you yeah. can imagine <laughs> my, oh my living gosh. room filled with their friends, and they're giving their opinion of what's happening, what should happen, and they don't understand why it's not happening, and they want to call somebody to make it happen. So, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, that is so fun, though. It's so nice. So many people have said to me, you know, is uh, is Michael playing tonight? Is Marcus playing? You know, Michael's brother plays for Creighton. It's like are they playing because during COVID, everybody's been so bored. It's like they look forward to watching yeah. them on TV. You know, so it's it is nice and it's fun. So many college games are aired now on TV and everything, but it's nice. And who would have thought? I mean, Michael played with Kem back at um on Expressions for yes. a little bit. Yes. Um, yes. So it's pretty amazing that they're here. They are the same NBA team. I mean, I would never thinking back when I was watching them in high school think that these guys are going to be playing together in the NBA. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny it's because special. when Michael came to um, to the Magic, I'm like, where do I know him from? And it bothered yeah. me for the longest time. I'm like, wait, they played AAU together in Rhode Island. I was like, yeah, this is so cool. And then Cam's like, yeah, you don't remember yeah. him? <laughs> and I remember that. <laughs> I'm like, listen, Cam, you went through a lot of friends, man, but. <laughs> I know, I know a lot of players. Well, and yeah. Michael's pretty loud and animated too. Kem's not, I mean, if Kem wasn't so big, he, I probably wouldn't remember him because he was just so quiet, you know, had this quiet smile all the time right? and. Yeah, right? I wasn't full of emotion and stuff, but Michael had plenty of that, so he was probably a good person to play with. 
Well, let me tell you, Mandy, as quiet as Kim was on the court, it was as quiet as he was, is the long drive that took me to get there to all those games. Okay? Because every right. game when we played at Expressions was a long ride for me. It was eight hours, and Kim oh. never had anything to say. Nothing. So <laughs> I was no. bored oh out of my gosh. tree driving to our games. <laughs> bored. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> but I can those were good though, times. He is quiet. Yes, yeah. yes. And I still, to this day, have my Team Expressions hat. Still. Oh, you do? It. I do. I will never get rid of that hat. I love it. It just, to me, it just means so much because it's really where Ken began when he was in the U.S. Like, he played AAU right. in Canada, but then when he moved to the U.S., it was with Todd. So it was fantastic. And I knew I remembered Michael at the time from somewhere, so... <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I know you think back and you put so much time and, and energy into into it. And I guess, you know, I, I coach AAU now and I always say to my players, you know, it's really about the journey. And it probably seems a little hypocritical because my, you know, son ended up going all the way to the NBA, which is kind of rare. But, right. you know, what we loved about it so much was those car rides and the time together. Yes. And whether it was silent or not, at least they had to spend time with you, yeah. you know, and all the going to all the games together and stuff. It was must yeah. have been, I mean, that's a big commitment for you guys. That's a long drive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was fun when he was awake, but <laughs> I, re- right. I remember <laughs> our games would finish nine, 10 o'clock and everybody was going home. You know what I mean? 20 minutes, an hour away. Not us. I was getting home at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. and oh getting up the next morning to wow. go to work. Right. But, but that's you know a what? Lot. I would never trade it for anything. I'm just so blessed that we had that opportunity. I mean, I remember driving in the dark bawling because there was like fog I couldn't see Kim snoring oh. oh yeah but you know what I was like yes team expression so, <laughs> so you, right you do what you gotta do right <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah so tell me about his rookie uh rookie year season and how you finally got to sit in the Wells Fargo Center as a parent of an NBA player oh gosh that was so exciting it was a uh... Again, just a, a great experience um, there in Philadelphia. And I think it was nice that it wasn't too far from our home. You know, it's a six hour drive and a, and a quick mm-hmm. flight for us to, for, you know, Michael to be moving away, you know, going from college pretty young and, and, and moving there was, was a big deal. Um, but it was pretty amazing. I mean, the, the Wells Fargo Center is so much fun and just had a really good time from the halftime show to the guys yeah. playing, just being a part of it. And the, you know, meeting everybody in the organization was really nice. Um, it was a good, it, it was a, it was a really fun experience for us. Our whole family really did enjoy it. Yeah. Well, you were saying earlier that your family loved, um, or you loved, um, NCAA ball, you loved college ball. So finally, when you got to the NBA, like, was it just as good for you? Probably not. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was fun. I would say the first like three or four games, it was fun. And then, you know, a lot of people know the story of how Philadelphia was tanking at the time. So, you know, it was tough. It was tough for Michael to lose like that. He's not used to losing. His yeah. high school team was very successful. His college team went to the final four. So he hadn't like truly experienced consecutive losses like that. And to go right. from, 30 games a year to 82 and the goal is to like lose 60 of them. It was definitely, you know, it it wore on him and then it it kind of wore on us. We still enjoyed the games and going to watch him and, you know, watch them battle anyway, because it's not like the players weren't trying. It was just a lot of turnover with the team and a lot of behind the scenes business stuff for us learning. You know, you learn so much as you go that of course, you know, if I went back to, do it again. We'd probably do some things, you know, we definitely would do some things differently because we just didn't know what to expect, but it was still always fun watching them. And, you know, we went to some of the away games and going to the different arenas. We certainly have gone to basketball and, you know, Michael and the NBA and even college, we've gone to so many places that we would never have, you know, gone to before. So that's been really fun. Yeah, that's true. I don't think I've been to an away game. Oh yeah. Toronto, the Raptors. Yeah, it's true. I'm trying to think, had I been to any away games since Ken's been with the Magic, but I believe just the Raptors. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm Canadian. So I heard, of course I heard those games are fun. We haven't been up to Toronto, but everyone says that those games are really fun. So we went last year, and I think we were 20 deep. And Really? Yes, of course. And <laughs> our family, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we go big and we go loud. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we were beating the Raptors. And let me tell you, those games are fantastic. Raptors, what a team. 
and magic was beating them. And oh my goodness, all you heard was my family. That's it. Oh no, start cheering. Oh my God, yes. all 20,000 people were quiet except the little 20. <laughs> <laughs> and Kim's dad, oh, he's gonna kill me, stood up and started, started singing. It ain't over to the fat lady singing. I hear her singing. <laughs> I'm like, oh my no, God. Sir. And we're all sitting there like, security. <laughs> They're going to come kill us. I was going to say, how are the people there? Because that does not fly, at, you know, at the yeah. garden. It doesn't yeah. in Boston. You cannot. I have to, like, announce to everybody that my son's playing, so I am going to, by accident, probably cheer for him every once in a while <laughs> because the fans don't react well to that. How yeah. are they in Toronto? <laughs> um, they didn't like us. <laughs> yeah, they did. I bet. And, <laughs> yeah. And then the second time, we had courtside seats, and I had my nephew with me. And he kept saying, Andy, Wendy, are these all Orlando Magic fans? And I'm like, keep quiet. <laughs> he <wants to> see, just <laughs> And people are staring at us. No, looking. they're not. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, no, it's just us. <laughs> Be quiet, Mike. Oh, it's <laughs> just awesome, us. Though. Yeah. But it was fun. I mean, listen, everybody knew that Ken Burke's family was there for sure. Right. But I mean, it was all in love, right? Yeah. I mean, they know we're Canadian yeah. and, you know what I mean? So it was fun. And I got to meet uh, exactly. the Raptors super fan. He came to me and we started talking. So it was just funny. But yeah, oh, they didn't, nice. like, us at, they didn't like us at the beginning of the game, though, <laughs> at all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael was player of the week on his very first week um, uh, during his rookie year. He was rookie of the month um, of his conference he played in the Rising Stars Challenge during All-Star Weekend, and he was later named Rookie of the Year. I mean, he accomplished so, so much in, in a few months. Soon after, though, he unfortunately suffered um, a shoulder injury, which later denied him to play in, in the Summer League. So he went from such right. a high to facing adversity that temporarily prevented him from playing. So what was that like for him? It was hard. I mean, his shoulder was actually hurting him a lot of that, that rookie year. Um, and it was, you know, it was swollen off and on and we had gone back and forth. Should he even be playing, but he was having such a great year. You know, we did, we felt like, oh, he should just, you know, try to stick it out. But I think it was tough. I think, you know, for him not really understanding at that point too, like, you, you get the shoulder surgery and you repair it, but now you miss an entire off season of yeah. workouts. Like you miss the summer league, but you also miss really strengthening your overall entire body. You miss getting, you know, doing, you can, you go from college to the NBA, that time in between, you don't, you, now that you're in the NBA, you know what you need to work on. Like right. this is a different game. You know, a lot of it, a lot of his college game translated to the NBA, but you, you got to work every off season. And he wasn't able to have, you know, get that off season in. And, you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a setback and it was frustrating, I think for him. And, um, you know, when he came back, I think he had a good, he had a pretty good year when he came back, even though he got traded to Milwaukee, he played well in Milwaukee that year. Um, and then he ended up, you know, having to have another surgery after that on his hip. So he tore his hip labrum. Um, so I, I think he's, it was definitely going, going, you know, you went from a high to a, okay, now we got to figure this out. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, um, and the rehab was good and everything, but he, you know, he's had to face, he's had a lot of adversity in terms of um, fighting through the injuries and the timing of it and that, and, you know, trades and all of that stuff that comes into play. I think he's, he's definitely been through a lot and he's bounced back from most of it. Um, I think it's, you know, at the end of the day, probably made him a, a stronger person, but it's been hard, you know, as you know, it's just, a, it's a hard league to stay in. But how did he overall. cope? Because he was traded to, like you said, the Milwaukee Bucks, and then he was traded a few more times over a few years to the Bulls, the Hornets, uh, the Rockets. I believe he signed back to the Bulls, but then was waived. I mean, players can go through so much movement and it can be so stressful and disappointing, you know what I mean? To, to just to say the least. Yeah. So how did, so how did he actually cope with um, being traded multiple times? And was there a team that he couldn't just adjust to? You know, I think as far as the teams that he was being traded to, he never, that was, you know, 
he's an easy kid to, you know, as far as getting along and, you know, sort of jumping in and, and being in the mix that way. I think, you know, when you're traded, you kind of got to prove yourself and figure your, yeah. your minutes out. And then on top of it, you're moving to a new place. I mean, Michael's kind of a family guy. I mean, the, the obviously the money in the NBA is great, but, you know, we come from a background where it doesn't necessarily buy you happiness. So for him to, you know, kind of balance and figure it all out, like, this is tough. I'm in a new community. You're, you're never truly a part of a community when you're in the NBA because you kind of right. really can't be. I mean, if right. you have children and they start in the school systems, you start to meet people that way. But he hadn't had any children at that point through all of those trades. So, you're, you know, you're bouncing around. You're setting up your new apartment at each place. I mean, it was very, very unsettling. And he had a really hard time with it. There was, you know, long periods of time where he wasn't sleeping at all. Um mm you know, the injuries that he had and rehabbing and coming back from them took, just took a big toll, I think, on him mentally and physically. He had two shoulder repairs. He had a hip repair. His knees were, you know, went undiagnosed with some um, issues with a uh, different type of t- tendonitis for a while. So he's, you know, battling all that while trying to prove yeah. himself on a team. It's one thing when you get, you know, you suffer some injuries when you're with one team that's invested and has really bought into you and there's some trust there, but when you're having to keep, you know, proving yourself through all of these trades, it becomes difficult. So as this family, we're seeing the other side of it, you know, he's showing up doing his best and putting a smile on his face and working hard and trying to be that energy guy that he's always been, but, you know, he's coming home and, you know, he went through some bouts of some really deep, deep depression that, you know, we had to kind of step in and just say, let's like reevaluate what we're doing here because, you being happy at the end of the day and, and, and being okay with yourself has to come first before yeah. you give to anything else. And, you know, I think Houston was sort of his rock bottom. And at that point when, you know, he got waived from Houston, especially since he's kind of started off the year doing pretty well there. So I think he was a little bit shocked when it all happened. And, um, you know, that's when I just said, you need to figure out, we, we need to figure out if this is what you want to do. Cause there's so much in life you can do. You know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to keep moving. You don't have to feel like you don't have a home. Right. You know, you don't have to be awake every night. Like Something's got to change. And um, he was pretty upset. And I, he called me one morning just, you know, basically in tears. And I said, um, you got to make some decisions here. He had just broken up with his girlfriend. He had just had a baby. She moved back to California with her family with the baby. And I said, you can either stay in bed, Michael, and, you know, not do anything about it, or you can pack your stuff up. You have the means, go move there, move to California. You know, you can work out in California and just work out every day. Yeah. Go back to the basics, go back to a gym. And he joined like a, a local, like national chain gym. It was kind of funny. Cause he's like playing pickup with like guys from the streets, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was every day, but he just went back to like old school basketball, how he grew up and, um, you know, he moved right near close to his baby. So he was seeing his baby every day, which made him happy. And then he was working out and, you know, thank God that he did do that. Cause he had made the decision that he still wanted basketball to be a big part yeah. of his life as his profession. And when his agent called about Orlando, he was ready. Amen. I mean, there's one thing we do not want our boys to feel as undervalued. Right. I mean, they, they get to that. And that's point. easy. I think in this business yes. to feel that way. I mean, social media kills them every day right. and, you got to try to convince them. And I'm sure as a mom, you were tempted to do his first year in the NBA when people oh, were writing yeah. negative things about him. I was oh, like, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know if you know who you're talking yeah. about here. <laughs> yeah, <but> yeah. <laughs> that was me. I started emailing and like <laughs> tweeting everybody back. And my husband's yeah. like, Mindy, you're going to be exhausted doing that every day. And I was like, I don't care. Did you see what they said? <laughs> yeah, that, that was me. I'm like, say it again. I dare you. <laughs> and the people were like, exactly. Are you I was like, do you even know to- who you're talking to right now? And yeah. who are you? What do you do? <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because I would, at the beginning, I would respond. I was nice, sorta. And then they would respond, but are you Kim's mom? And I'm thinking, no. Because <laughs> now right. I realize, <laughs> I now I realize, wait, they know who I am. Like, let me get an alias. <laughs> I Let know exactly. That's what, in the beginning, I was like, "Darn it! I should have been smart enough to have like a, yeah. a fake name." But you know, yeah. no, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, the, and it was exhausting. Is, yeah, yeah. I had to like, stop doing it. I was like, "Mom, you tell me not to read it, but you are." And I was like, "I'm trying to stop." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're gonna say with Mandy and Wendy, magic mom bullies. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So all that to say, we're not gonna stop. We're just gonna yes. come up with alias names. I'll, right, I'll right. Think, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a name. Girl, we'll think of something. Whatever. All right. 
<laughs> well, in 2019, the Magic signed um, Michael to, I think it was two 10-day contracts, from what I remember. And then I think he finished yes. the season, that season. And he's still with the team today. So he has quite the fan yeah. base. And I'm a fan. So, And we're so blessed to have him. I mean, he brought Thank such you. a different dynamic to the squad, right? So how does yep. the Magic organization in your perspective, different, differ from another, any um, other? You know, he had, um, he had played for coach Clifford in Charlotte, um, for mm-hmm. a bit. And then, That's right. you know, that the whole, um, you know, team kind of blew up that year. Clifford was gone, you know, the staff was gone and stuff. So when Michael didn't get picked back up by them, um, you know, he was kind of okay with it just in the sense where everybody else was, you know, they, they were making big changes. But so when, you know, Orlando called, it was nice to have coach Clifford, um, I think was the perfect, you know, coach for Michael in, in returning after being waived where his, his confidence was, you know, pretty fragile at, at the time, even though I think he was really ready to go in and play, but that's not easy. You know, you got 10 days to kind of prove yourself or you could be back without a job again. And, yeah. and Michael loves basketball. I think that's the hard part for him is he truly just loves the game, you know, mm-hmm. and it was good because Clifford's the type of coach that I, I feel like I would say um, it's just you know, honest with Michael and, you know, he, he's made Michael a better person. He's helped, uh, he's helped him navigate through this as a business, um, you know, doing something you love, but at the same time, it's a business and his communication has been, I think really big because Michael likes transparency and, and, and yeah. likes, you know, to know that he's going to be able to have an honest conversation and, and the organization has been, has been pretty good with that. And mm-hmm. I don't think you find that, you know, all the time in this industry. Yeah, that's very true. And it's hard to find a coach that you're comfortable with, right? Yeah, you know, I don't, the coaches don't have an easy job. I think it's just the way that it's all set up. It's, it's pretty tricky to, 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 to always try to figure it out. You can show up, work hard, you can be the best, you know, top five player in practice. And you you grow up feeling like, oh, if I'm the, if I work hard and, you know, harder than my teammates and I'm one of the better players that practice, I'm going to play. And it's not always that way. There's so many other dynamics that are involved. So for Michael to, you know, finally get a grasp on that and, and figure it all out. I think, I think Orlando had a big part in that. Yeah. Well, let's move forward to the bubble. Place. Let's move forward to oh, the yes. bubble. So did yeah. Michael ever share with you what it was like playing in there without any fans? Um, his feelings about being confined to minimum areas, being away from friends and family. And then, of course, when our game got canceled, when the Milwaukee Bucks staged a walkout after the Jacob Blake shooting. Yes, he um, he was not a huge fan of the bubble. I mean, he's pretty easygoing, but he also doesn't like feeling like, a you know, caged in at all yeah. either. He's a very energetic guy, as you can see on the court. He's yeah. definitely has energy. So I, I it was hard. I mean... I think what Michael really enjoys about the NBA is that, that um, adrenaline you get from the arena, right. From all the fans cheering and from, you know, it's game time. So he, he's a game time type of player. He, like, he loves that and embraces it. So I think the bubble was hard for him. And then on top of it, he got injured in there. His um, he hurt his ankle, his foot um, got injured. So he wasn't playing. So you take that piece along with it. Yeah. It was pretty, you know, it was pretty depressing for him. He was pretty low. He was, you know, he would say fa- he FaceTimed a ton, like every day he was FaceTiming us from his room. So I, I think it was pretty hard. And then, um, with the game with Milwaukee, uh, he actually, he's really close with Giannis just because of, from when he was in Milwaukee, they stayed right. pretty tight. So he kind of had uh, a little bit of a heads up that that was, was going to happen. And, you know, I think he felt good to be a part of it, to feel like yeah. he had a voice and, since you know michael's been really involved in the community um he's been involved in helping to represent the magic you know with everything that was going on you know i think it meant a lot to him and i think it's been great for him to have a voice you know and and for the nba to have a voice in general yeah me too i was surprised but at the same time i was so happy that they actually finally stood up which is finally but they actually stood up you know what i mean it wasn't enough that they had um the writings on the back of their shirts or you know what i mean or they had the the huge buses like the raptors they had the cool bus with the black lives matter on the side and all that but you know what we need it more 
and yes. the players finally doing the walkout to me I was like that is that to me that showed a lot of power showed a lot of respect and right. I got it I was so happy I was like okay listen you know what I mean this is going to stand for something you know what I mean it's it's, it's a game at the end of the day it's just a game but we're talking we're, we're comparing games versus life right so, exactly yeah yeah and, and some people agreed with it and some people didn't but at the end of the day yeah. I think the players making the decision, it wasn't something that came from, you know, above or, you know, it wasn't a decision made by, you know, any type of administration or anything like that. It was something that they did from their yeah. hearts and, absolutely, you know, it was, it was authentic and it was genuine. So was, yeah. I thought it was nice. Yeah, me too. Well, we are now in a new season and we don't have Michael back yet from his injury. So can I you know. shed some light on some, on a possible return date? Well, we thought possibly tonight, but um, I think they wanted to give it a game or two more. So maybe next game. Okay. You know, he's definitely feeling much better. I think that, Good. you know, the staff is being careful because they don't want it to, it to turn turn into something long term. Yeah. So yeah, true. I'm hoping, you know, a bone, he's got a bone bruise on, with a sprained ankle. And I think a bone bruise, it does just take more time to heal than just your typical sprained ankle that you might be able to tape up and go out there and play anyway. I think they're... Um, the team is just being cautious right now. Right. Well, you've seen him play live uh, in the Amway Center, but have you seen, um, have you been there this season since the, like, w- with the restrictions? I haven't. You know, everybody else yeah. in my family has gone down and been able to see a game, but I haven't been able to, so I haven't yet. I was, I am, I think I'm going to be coming down either this week or early next week, though. Yeah. But, um, you know, my husband, been, has been to the game and then my kids have been they said it's very different have you been no i can't even get in the country never mind who have i been oh, <laughs> yes. i can't do it if i want to. well i can but then it comes oh, with like god. a quarantine session and yeah no no i'm good I'll oh be, my gosh I'll yes be, nope <laughs> i mean i'm just so curious if um does Having 3,000 people versus 20,000, does it change the game or the dynamics of the game? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. You know, I don't know if maybe the players are getting used to it, but I think it it certainly, I think it changes the experience. My younger son's at Creighton and they went from 18,000 to 1,800 and oh my God. I know that my voice is heard loud and clear now uh, yeah, <laughs> throughout the yeah. whole place. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my mom's here. Oh, my God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that would be me and Cammy would turn around and give me that eye. And I'm like, too loud? Sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too loud. Yeah. No? no? I know you forget. <laughs> and, uh, I think I said something. Thing and some of Marcus's teammates were shaking their heads like in agreement on the bench. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so loud. Everybody's hearing me. <laughs> Listen, in our family, we come loud at Kem's game. And so real quick story, Kem's godmother, she's going to just kill me for saying this, but at the same time, she's going to laugh and love me. We went to the Raptors game and she spoils Kem. Like the whole family always has to bring something. We never see him. So we right. have to bring it to the Raptors game. Hello. So, <laughs> so Kem <laughs> likes, uh, she bakes a lot. So we get to the Raptors game and we had to sneak in banana yes. bread. <laughs> and the security was oh like, my gosh. where are you going with this banana bread? And she's like, I'm Ken Burke's aunt. And he really likes banana bread. And she let him in. And he, <laughs> I mean, he let her in. It was hilarious. We had all kinds of junk in our purses and our bags, like Scooby snacks and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, the security let us. But he was looking at us like, are you really going to bring this in? Yeah. Number 24. Oh yeah, my gosh. we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do man so <laughs> that might be is a little so easier. funny and if yeah <laughs> oh my gosh that is a riot that's awesome though yeah well we'll have to so uh great. we'll have to when we go back to the Amway center we'll see what you and i can sneak in for our kids okay i know i was just thinking of that i was like hmm not much of a baker but i have yeah. to think of something <laughs> Anything store-bought is fine for me. I'm not much of a baker either. Right. No, no. (laughs) So now let's learn some fun facts about Michael. Okay. What is that go-to dish that you make that he absolutely loves? He's really like, um, likes it pretty simple. Like chicken, rice, vegetables. I honestly Mm -hmm. don't have like a go-to like. Yeah special thing that he loves um 
which is really a reflection of the fact of how bad of a cook I am. But <laughs> I think I'm glad you said it. Because- I'm like, Mandy, he doesn't ask you because you just said that you can't cook. <laughs> She's like, I can order a mean pizza. All right. <laughs> Nothing yeah, wrong with exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. I mean, he will say, because I think like, sometimes he'll be like, oh, can you make that kielbasa? Because I'll make this kielbasa with brown sugar and rice and stuff. And it's not necessarily very good for him. And he's been trying to, he's, you know, been learning to, he's learned over the years to eat really well. So kielbasa probably hasn't been in his everyday diet, but he will say mm-hmm. to me, can you make that kielbasa? Like you make, that's probably the only thing that he'll ask for from me. <laughs> it's okay. Kim, Kim likes my chicken and rice too. And I asked him the other day, yeah. we were talking about it. And he says, oh, I love to create your chicken and rice, mom. He says, you, that was the one thing you never burnt. Really? I'm like, I'm like how dare you? <laughs> I thought it was delicious. He's like, yeah, because it wasn't burnt. I'm like, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so I was like, really? Was it a go-to or was it like his only option? I don't know. Whatever. Now he's old exactly. enough. He can buy his own chicken. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> What was one item as a child that he could not live without other than a basketball? One item as a child. No, I'm just kidding. If it's basketball, it's a basketball. I know. I was going to say it wasn't necessarily just a basketball. It could be a football or a baseball. He just, he was never like a, he played video games, but he was never like a kid that, like to sit around much. He was definitely really, really active. Yeah. So I would have to say it was some sort of ball. Absolutely. Yeah, my kids was video games. So <laughs> did you have a childhood nickname for him? And if you did, what was it? Um, I always called him Michael. In fact, I didn't like it when people called him Mike. I always liked Michael. But when he was really little... When I can get away, you know, until I could get away with it. He was my little pumpkin. And I remember when I had Macy, my daughter, he was like five at the time. And one day I called her my little pumpkin and he was like, hey, I thought I was your little pumpkin. (laughs) (laughs) So it was funny, his name that I just kind of, I never even knew if he actually heard me say it. Once I called one of my other, my daughter, I was like, oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, You are my pumpkin, Michael. Yeah. See how kids, yeah. eh? they're like, don't call me that in public. And then when you call somebody else, they're like, what? <laughs> don't right. call her exactly. that either. That's my name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. It's like, don't say it aloud, but it's mine. <laughs> yes. Totally. Now I want to ask some tips and advice. So what three tips would you give a mom who has to deal with a coaching decision that she did not agree with? That's a tough one because it would sort of, it would sort of depend on, you know, I would, it would have to, depi- it would depend on what my response would probably pertain more to what it is she was upset about. But I think right. I would just be there to let her vent and try to encourage her to not call the coach. I've heard some yeah. funny story, <laughs> some NBA moms that have called the coach directly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> or we laugh because one of the moms told us how she called the NBA directly, like the NBA headquarters. <laughs> Oh, I know a couple of moms that would do that. Who do I speak to? Yeah, she like, yeah, tried to call the commissioner. Yes, <laughs> on one of the teams. I was like, I was like, all this time I thought I was so bad, but I listened to all these stories and I was mm-hmm. like, these are great stories. But yeah, I would encourage her to do just that, just to vent about it. Don't say anything to your child unless your son or daughter said something to you, and um, you know, let it go. I would just say you got to let it go unless you're. Unless your child's upset about it. Yeah, I've I've heard of some moms that have called the NBA. And I'm like, you did? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what'd they say? <laughs> I was so shocked. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, did she tell me that she called the NBA? At serious too. I thought it was a great idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, and yes. your child's still and employed? Said, Are you allowed back at right, the game? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the stuff that moms do, right? At the end of the day, they are our babies. Don't be messing with our babies. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's right. Mama bear. Mama bear in effect. It's That's... taken me a long time to learn how to how to ma- manage all of that, too, especially growing up coaching your kids. And all of a sudden, you're not coaching anymore. Someone else is coaching them. And you're watching them try to figure it all out. It's not easy. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Sometimes it's hard to keep our opinions to ourselves, eh? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so what advice would you give to a player about how to deal with a tough teammate? Again, I always try to tell my kids to, you know, pick and choose what you want to address with the teammate. You know, I feel like boys are, it's a little bit different. It's not, boys like get upset and they forget about it. Yeah. You know, a little bit faster than a lot of times girls um, do. Girls tend to carry things that are said for a bit of a longer time. But I've always told my kids, like, you need to speak up. Like, if you have an issue with one of your teammates, then you need to talk to them about it and try to talk to them about it when you're in, you know, good space, not, not while you're heated about it. But I also said that, you know, I also just tell them to, my kids aren't, you know, they're more on the quiet side for the most part with stuff like that. Michael's probably the best at it, but the other three are. It takes them a lot to have, you know, to get aggravated or to have to say something. Usually that's why I've learned over time. A lot of times stuff bothers me more than it bothers my kids. So I've got to learn better to deal with it. Yeah. And it's so true what you said um, when you're saying boys would just deal with it and just forget it. And girls would right. keep that beef the whole season. But mm-hmm. <laughs> the entire yeah. season, Susie made me mad because, I don't know, she was wearing my same shoes and it's the whole season. It's like <laughs> Right. Yep. <laughs> one comment it can just carry on and on and on oh yeah and so oh, yeah. fortunately my daughter with three brothers my daughter grew up with you know three brothers so she's not you know she's not into the drama and stuff so it was a little bit easier with her than some of the girls that you know I've coached before that grew up in families with sisters and stuff like that it can it can be yeah. a different experience altogether well if you could give only one piece of advice to another courtside mom what would it be I would say to enjoy it yeah. You know, I think um, it's hard because <clears throat> there's so much you see your kids go through so much when they're in the NBA. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you forget to just stay in the day and enjoy it. Yeah. So something that I've learned over time is I don't have to worry about, you know, next week or the next trade or, you know, what's going to happen um, when this contract's up is I have to figure out how to be in today and just be grateful and enjoy the day today. Absolutely. Well, I'm looking forward to getting back to the Amway Center where you and I can sit down and hang out and cheer our boys on. Hopefully that day is going to come very, very soon. I know. I hope so, too. I hope it is going to come soon because it's great when it's great to know. You know, I've been to some other teams where you just don't have the time or everyone's sort of on different schedules. So. You don't get to necessarily hang out with the other moms, but I would love Orlando. There's a nice vibe there, so it would be fun to definitely yeah. hang out. Yeah, it is a nice we vibe. We could do a little there. pre-gaming, meet up before the game, we'll go out after or two. We could extend it. Of course. Our boys would be like, where's my mama at? <laughs> right. <laughs> I love exactly. going to Orlando. Yeah. Yeah, I would tell her, Kev, give me your car and you go home and I'll see you later. Right. Don't wait up and wait. Yes. Give me the key. Yeah. <laughs> give me the right alarm to the house and see you. Good night. Oh, yeah. I would send him to bed and his wife and yeah, everybody. Good night. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So yeah, I'm funny. going out with her. And so he always funny. says to me, you know moms? You know the other moms? Yeah. Like he, he can't get over right. the fact that I know moms from other teams. It's so funny. And right. Like, I know. Yeah. He said to me, man, you'd be friends with anybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So he told me the other day. I was like, really? He says, anybody, mom. And I'm, like, I'm, know. Well, I'm sure for him, too, because he's so quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Cam is that PlayStation kid. You know what I mean? And I go to his house. I'm like, I'm not trying to sit up here and watch you play PlayStation. Like, he won't even let me play. I got to sit there and watch you? No. See ya. Oh, my so- gosh. <laughs> right. And Michael was the opposite. Michael's like, can I have a friend over? I'm, can I, I'm going to a friend's. Can I have a friend over? And I'd be like, could you just sit still? Wow. No, nope, Cam is the opposite. He's- Nope. Yeah. Nope. I'd be like, do you want to have friends over? I'm not understanding this nonsense. I'd be like, no. He was so content. <laughs> Just he and his brother sitting there playing PlayStation. That was it. That was all. If there's any little children in my house, it was because it was my younger son that invited all his little scrubs from the neighborhood. <laughs> I would have all the oh, whole no, football sir. team. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, little oh, kids. So you had a house full anyway. All right. the time. But you know what? It gave me so much joy. It really did. And I love yes. spending time with... Uh, with kids and you know what I mean? I, I just love being in the mix. So, so now yeah, we're going to have to get, deal with that. We got to get you, we got to get you here soon. Got to get, we got to both got to get to Orlando. Yes. Yes, we do. So everybody's going to have to go take that, um, the vaccination. <laughs> yes. 
take it, do what you got to do, swallow it, so we can always go back to normal and we can get to Orlando because that's all I want to do is just get right. to some games now. I need to get it's to some games. Weather. It's been a long yeah. time. I haven't seen Kem in a year. Oh, my gosh, year. really? Yeah. Yes. Over oh, a year. Gosh. At the Raptors game I was telling you about. That was the last time I seen him in 2019. Yes. So it's time. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. It, it really wow. is. So I'm I'm missing I'm missing the magic. I'm missing the games. I'm missing the hype and you know what I mean, the family room and the staff Fun, and yes. all that. Yeah. So hopefully that'll come very soon. Yes, um, definitely. Until then, I thank you so, so much for coming on the show. You're fantastic. It was beautiful meeting you. It really, really was. And I yes, appreciate same. you. Thanks so much for having me. It was great um, meeting you too. Of course. And keep in touch. Yes, definitely. I can't believe our kids have known each other for so long, but we've never I know. talked before. So this was great. And this is, We're going to make so up true. for a lot of time. I know. Years. Years. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you a lot that's happened since expression days up until today. There's so much basketball in between to laugh about. Right. I'm definitely. talking about laugh about. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have yourself a wonderful night and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you too. I appreciate All right. it. All right. Take man. care. Bye. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in guys. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Courtside Moms and make sure you subscribe to the podcast.